Welcome to BreezeLine, where the sky's the limit thanks to better internet. With lightning fast speeds up to one gig, you can game like a boss, stream like a pro, and watch like there's no tomorrow. Stream, watch, post, send, and trend. Do it all with our fiber-powered network, bringing you reliable, fast internet. Welcome to BreezeLine. Visit BreezeLine.com for latest offers. Service subject to availability. New customers in select areas only. Visit BreezeLine.com for details. Hi, I'm Matt Lieb. And I'm Vince Mancini. And this is Pod Pod Yourself a Gun. Gun. A Sopranos podcast where Vince Mancini and I go through every single episode of The Sopranos and and talk talk about about it. it. Thank you once again for joining us. Uh, Just a quick reminder, of course, to give us five stars in a review on the... uh, you know, Apple Podcast Store. Um, we had a, a, a lot of uh, good reviews uh, came in this week, um, except for one that I'm very. Uh-oh. Yeah, <laughs> there was one. What, uh, what, where... what happened? Okay, so I don't know what your guys' sense of humor is, but I'll tell you what mine isn't. Uh, it's jokes like this. I mean, I'll tell you. All right. A plus, but Matt is always talking about children's feet. I think he means well, <laughs> but it's a bit off-putting. So if you can get past that, it's great. I'm sorry. That's, Listen, a, really, that's a really good joke, I got to say. That is not, not for me. Yeah. Not for me. Funny. I'll tell you that, first of all, I don't like you guys encouraging it. I don't like this. Sorry. Um, you know, here's the thing. Uh, if, if people read the reviews to find out if they like the show and they see me talking about children's feet, mm-hmm. not going to help. All right? So... Just letting you know, but I do appreciate the five stars in review. Thank you. Also, remember, you can give five stars on the Spotify app. Um, Just up top, of course, I have to mention our $100 donor, Erica Nord, the most beautiful bosomed lady in the world. (laughs) I'm sorry. Uh, And then, of course, there's the $200 donor, Ryan, who, uh, oh, my God, I've never seen such a uh, strong penis uh, (laughs) before. But um, something new has happened, Vince. Ken Lee Bidwell, Mm -hmm. who was uh, our first $100 patron, Uh just upped his patron uh, edge to $300 a month. Like Ken Lee bids high, you know? Yeah. All right. That's that's mm -hmm. no, I get it. It's good. But I just want to say that is uh, unbelievable. He started a bidding war. Hey, Kenley uh, bidding war. Settle down, you know? Yeah, uh, with um, with Ryan. And so um, can you guys top that and go to 400? That would be stupid. Do not do this. <laughs> I mean, if you if you feel you must, fine. But I, I like at a certain point, I'm like, I don't know what we owe you now. Like there's levels to this shit. And so I'm scared is what I'm saying. Um I guess at some point I will have to fly over to where you're at and um, meet you and then let you, um, you know, uh, I don't know, like have your way with me. I'm not really sure, dude, but yeah. I just know. I He's know got a that saw I, wood on that le- that ass. Okay. I don't know what, I don't know what that means. He's going to go Mo and Joe on you. Oh, all right. Okay. Now I got it. You're doing a Mo and yeah, Joe reference. Very gonna, good. Yeah. He's going to take, he's going to take the wood out from the caboose wait no that yeah opposite, i know what you mean you, you, look there's some innuendo in there do it do there's it some innuendo will. it's not a perfect metaphor but no. kenley kenley bidwell um i i love you i i truly i'm in love with you and i uh if i ever have a child their middle name well i don't know maybe this is too much but uh i love you <laughs> braxton like, kenley bidwell lieb that'll be yeah th- that's right or are you gonna um, give your kids the hyphen fiorentini lieb or Lieb Fjorn, I guess, I, yeah. It'll be Lieb Teeny. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. We're just going to we're gonna put it together. Uh, Lieb Teeny, that's also the name of my penis. All right, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Ken Lee, I love you, and you are great. And now let's get into this a little bit. Today, Vince and I are going to be talking about from Season 6, Episode 10 of The Sopranos, Mo and Joe. And our guest today... You know her and love her, of course, as the host of the Hysteria Hysteria podcast on Crooked Media. She's also a television writer. She's written for things like It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Ladies and gentlemen and everyone else, our guest today is Erin Gloria Ryan. 
Hey, thanks for hey. having me. Thanks for coming on, Aaron. Really appreciate it. Uh, oh, I appreciate being here. It's nice to have um, a uh, a TV writer on because I always feel like you know this is a TV TV podcast. You know, mm-hmm. we talk about about television and and who better to ask about television stuff than someone who writes uh, who writes scripts. You uh, know. Yeah, yeah. Although sometimes I think I mean I haven't been writing for TV for a little while. I've been mm-hmm. taking time to be a mommy. Sure. Um, but uh, sometimes watching TV when I'm like in a writer's room, I can't do it because it feels like work. It's oh, like, yeah. Ugh, like if you're working on a book and you go into a bookstore, you're like, oh, all these people did all the work that I'm supposed to be doing. <laughs> yeah. ah, it's like, yeah. it's, it's not relaxing. Yeah, that's why Matt cannot go into the dick sucking factory. He gets <laughs> really stressed out and... <laughs> <laughs> that is not why I can't go there. Oh, okay. Sorry. There's a different reason. Um, I hate you, Vince. This is, listen, Vince, if you ever want a chance to ever get this podcast on Crooked Media, uh-huh. you are blowing it right uh, now, well, dude. Well, sorry. You're the one who started the show with all the donor, true. donor talk. That is that is true. I talked about donors. But uh, Sopranos, Aaron, uh, do you like the Sopranos? Yes. Yes. Hell yeah. Yeah, I do. I do like this show. Um, it's, a, it's a good show, right? It's a pretty good show. You know, it's funny um, when you guys, in, when you invited me to come on the show. Yeah. I'm not all the way through. I'm I'm like a Ooh. first time watcher. Oh, I won't yeah. do, we'll do no spoilers then. So no, no. I mean, I already spoiled it for myself. Okay. So I mean, like yeah. I was, you know, I was working in uh, at Gawker Media in 2010, which was a few years after The Sopranos ended. But right. at that point, like, it was impossible not to have The Sopranos spoiled by, like, cultural osmosis. It sure, was just, like, sure. A, it was just around. Like, everybody, it, it was just assumed that everybody had seen it. And at that point, it's like, you can't right. spoil a show that's, like, more than a year since it ended. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I, that's, th- I totally agree with that. Uh, uh, there are people who still get on us about um, spoilers on this show. And like we, I think we do a pretty good job of like telling people that we're about to do a spoiler. But there's also part of me that's like, it, at this point, is it is your personal responsibility to binge this show? You know what I mean? Yeah. And if you, but if you're someone who worries about spoilers, if you're not someone who worries about spoilers, then uh, you're a Congre- regular. Yeah, congratulations for person. being a well-adjusted adult. Like I get uh, <laughs> working for a media site, like I get yelled at about spoilers that had nothing to do with things that I've written, like something that like somebody else wrote that I didn't even see, and someone's like. I can't believe you guys fucked up Boba Fett. I'm never coming here again. And I'm like, I didn't even know that was a show to begin with. Uh, and you just sound insane. So congratulations. Yeah. I, I like the funniest thing to me is when there's like a TV show that got made from like a book that's existed for a long time. Yeah. And you, talk, you mentioned something. And it's like a book that was widely read. So like you mentioned something about something that happened in the book and is going to happen in the TV show. And people are like, spoilers. It's like, no, read. If you yeah. read more, yeah. if you read more, you actually kind of get a jump on a lot of stuff that Hollywood ends up making into something, you know? Right. Like, Little fires everywhere. Oh no! Spoilers. No, that was a very popular book. Like yeah, just yeah. Read. The the worst was I remember when Lord of the Rings came out and people were like <laughs> spoiler alerting Lord of the Rings and I'm like this book is a million years old. <laughs> right. Like I like when they you do haven't it, uh, read. I mean I like when they like do it based okay. on like historical events where it's like oh shit <laughs> like I spoiled the death of Fred Hampton at the end of Judas <laughs> and the Black Messiah. It's like well I mean right. a lot of us actually knew what happened in that story because it was like a real life thing but sure yeah, yeah. i guess like we could save that it's like when you look at a calendar and you see easter sunday on there you're like you fucking spoiled good friday for me <laughs> yeah, exactly. i didn't know he was gonna come back yeah like, i thought he was just dead at that point oh spoiler alert easter <laughs> like, jesus came it, back for that final scare they always do that <laughs> mm-hmm, yeah people love the good final jump scare <laughs> yeah you think he's dead and then I, lo- I love i love jesus as a slasher villain <laughs> i mean he would scare a lot of like white american evangelicals if he came back now he was like yeah. a swarthy middle easterner yeah right as they a brown like, guy oh, yeah right ah get this guy out of the airport i mean freddy love- krueger got burned to death and he comes back like with burn scars like how's that any different than jesus showing up 
with like a crucifix and like a crown of thorns. Like he's 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 still they, in the stuff that they killed him in. Like well, Jesus' like beautiful mm-hmm. Western European features were not disrupted by yeah. like flame. Like Freddy Krueger doesn't have like a, a sexy model face like right like white Jesus. Yeah, does. or the ripped I, abs. Yeah, I do love the idea of like like stabbed in both sides, both hands and feet, like all bloody Jesus coming back from the dead in America 2022 and everyone's like, oh, he's brown. <laughs> like that's the thing they'd actually be scared of. <laughs> right. Not like he's covered in blood. or Not, Yeah, he's... crown of thorns, face covered in blood. They'd be like, why is this Arab here? <laughs> Lock is... the doors, honey. And not even God stops in this part of Newark. <laughs> it's, it's, like an, it's like a, it's a Middle Eastern socialist more like, which is yeah. scarier to American Christians than almost anything. Socialism. Right. Um, yeah, it Jesus. was literally the scariest thing they could imagine <laughs> yeah but uh but this isn't a jesus podcast no this is a sopranos podcast and we of course cannot start the podcast without first playing the theme song pod Pod. Pod. Podcast. Pod. 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 Podcast. All right, ladies and gentlemen and everyone else today, once again, we're going to be talking about from season six of The Sopranos, episode 10, Mo and Joe, which premiered on May 14th, 2006. Vince, can you break us off a little piece of that synopsis? Oh, I sure can. As soon as I scroll down to it, uh, <laughs> Tony reflects on how growing up with Janice colors his attitudes now, while Vito tries to make a new life for himself in New Hampshire. Mm-hmm. That is uh, that is basically what happens. But uh, what was happening, though, Vince, at the time oh, that this episode came out? I think what you're alluding to is that we cannot evaluate uh, art uh, divorce of its cultural context. Therefore, we got to put that cultural context back in. And for mm-hmm. that, we uh, go to the Remember When machine. Walk, walk. Teddy, daddy, bop, bop, shoo, bop. Remember then, 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 then. Remember when it's the lowest form of conversation. That's right. We're going all the way back to May 14th, 2006, when this episode, Mo and Joe, uh, first premiered. First thing that you got to understand about this time period uh, was that alligators killed three women in one week in separate incidents across the U.S. state of Florida. Wow. Yeah. Three and... The alligators were out of control. That's that's what everybody was talking about. Uh, this is from, there was it like a, I don't even remember. There's like a you know it's like a shark week, but there was alligator week happened. They wrote a lot of really intense stories about this. Uh, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. They got him. He was a nine foot six inch beast that took four days to trap and six people to haul in Saturday from the Sunrise Canal, where he killed a twenty eight year old jogger. And inside Jesus. his stomach, they found the grisly proof that they had the right alligator. Oh, my God. Uh, oh. For, for Kevin Garvey, a trapper and the owner of Nuisance Wildlife Control, finding the gator was personal. He often mm-hmm. patrols that very canal, working between Markham County Park and Florida 84, and he knows most of the gators that frequent it. When Jimenez's dis- dismembered body was found Wednesday by construction workers, he knew he would have to find this new gator before it could kill again. This all sounds like a front for a Florida-based serial killer. <laughs> yeah. like Just the, trying to the, pin it on gators? Trying to pin it on gators? I feel like uh, you could possibly get away with that in Florida, but uh, Jesus. Okay, so, that, so a lot of people getting eaten by gators in Florida, specifically yeah. women, mm-hmm. which is... Uh, I don't know why that is uh, specific to that. Well, they're but, more bite-sized usually. <laughs> They're a little smaller. I don't know. Unbelievable! I was just trying to put myself in the mind of a gator because that's how you got to catch 
That's gator. true, yeah. dude. That's how you got to catch a predator. Uh-huh. You got to put <laughs> you got to put yourself in the mindset of a gator. Um, like a uh, date, other news there's also like a from Dateline Florida. Producer like jog, jog, jogging alongside of the canal, waiting for the gator to come out and be like, "Hello." <laughs> <I am> yeah. <laughs> Doing the Were Mike you Wallace. here to eat? A woman. <laughs> the, like the the gator covering its face as the press is right, like. Right, right. I didn't like, know she. I didn't know that I was. I wasn't planning on eating her. I just, yeah. just wanted to talk. Oh, I was hungry. <laughs> we, I was, we're equal opportunity predators. We just happen yeah. to be the ones were women. Like we uh, we eat all people equally. <laughs> Also in Florida, oh. uh, this is in the middle of the real estate bubble, uh, pre, pre-financial pre crisis, uh, headline, middle class struggles to buy homes. Uh, locally, the median home sales price has written, risen 138%, but income only 16% since 2000. Uh, the American oh, dream man. is fast becoming a pipe dream for the middle class in central Florida and throughout the Sunshine State as new data shows households with incomes of $75,000 cannot afford to buy a home. Uh, and Yeah. The, w- wow. You can't afford to rent with that income now. <laughs> yeah, no. yeah. Although yeah, I know. The, the median home price in Orlando, uh, it, it only surpassed the pre-financial crisis mark in May of this year. So... It, wow! It burst and went down, and then now it's uh, now it's back to that mark. Um, I uh, guess people got used to the threat of gators on yes. a regular basis. <laughs> yeah, that was what's was driving them down all these years. Yeah, yeah, the threat of gators is really driving down the <laughs> the property values in the neighborhoods of Orlando. I was just thinking about like Orlando being the the thing that everybody thinks about when they think about Orlando is like Walt Disney World. Uh, yeah, I was going to say Universal Universal Studio. Sure, sure. Mickey Mouse uh, <laughs> lives at Universal Studios. No, I was just thinking. I was just picturing Mickey as like a slumlord, like going around like <laughs> like he's like Airbnb before Airbnb existed. <laughs> like he's driving up local prices and nobody can afford to live there anymore. Yeah, <laughs> get the fuck out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> oh my <gosh>. gosh. <laughs> Being evicted, yeah. <laughs> As he's Doug. getting kicked out, <laughs> that's him trying to evict somebody. Oh. I didn't know you had a Mickey Mouse impression in your pocket. I didn't know either. I swear to God, that was the first time I ever done it, and it feeling worked. feeling pretty good about it. I don't know if my Mickey is accurate anymore, or if I'm just doing the South Park version of uh, Mickey Mouse, where he's beating up the Jonas Brothers. Like that's the first thing that. <laughs> I've not seen that. <laughs> oh, that's a good oh, one. It's a good episode. Yeah. Really oh good episode. shit! I gotta check. He that slaps out. him around for not being uh, good pretend versions. Um, <laughs> other things that were happening in uh, May 2006. Uh, remember uh, Girls Gone Wild? That was uh, I do. That was a thing. Um, Girls Gone Wild guru ogles lad mags. Joe Francis, founder of the Girls Gone Wild franchise, is looking to move beyond soft core, soft porn and into publishing and is eyeing British multimillionaire Felix Dennis's magazine empire. Francis, sources said, has had some preliminary discussions about acquiring, acquiring Dennis's U.S. publishing assets, which include the music magazine Blender and Lad Mag's Stuff and Maxim, which this month features sopranoette Jamie Lynn Sigler. Oh, wow. Man. You got a, you got a Sopranos tie-in That's to right. Stuff magazine. That was... Uh... It's like the it was sort of the twilight of the la, of the like lad mags in the U.S. It was the twilight of all magazines. Yeah, everybody was flying high, like you know, taking hired cars to work. You were mm-hmm. like big shit if you worked in a magazine, and now it's like, oh no, you work in a magazine. Yeah, oh, it's like, like, oh, I'm sorry. Do you get paid? That's yeah. still a job. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Even if you work at the New Yorker, is like, is someone a lot richer than you trying to keep you from unionizing? Like, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I do love uh, the, uh, like there is that specific time period though where like like dudes I knew in high school who proudly displayed every stuff magazine <laughs> that they had they were just like oh check out this is all my issues of stuff and I'm like this is 
this is very close to you just showing me porn you like like it just it's sounds so it's like so much overcompensation it's you might as well call the magazine not gay magazine. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you put yeah. it on your coffee table like look i love you but like not in a gay way yeah, see yeah. This, see totally this. straight no homo magazine presents <laughs> no homo of- was like the the stuff magazine of lad mags but not gay was kind of the maxim it was really the yeah the pinnacle yeah. of that genre of magazine uh yeah this is a perfect uh time capsule because because it's about the girls gone wild guy preparing to buy uh, lad magazines. Uh, yeah. The titles could fetch between 200 million and 250 million. Oh my God. Uh, oh my God. So I, I love him going backwards. He's just <laughs> like, Hey, I, you know, I invented this like very popular line of soft core porn videos. I'm thinking about pivoting to telegram porn. Right. <laughs> That's uh, where we're just going to send words via Morse code that uh, get men off. Paint the word boobs on the side of a stagecoach. <laughs> right. <laughs> People are going to come out and watch it go by. It'll go from town to town, horse and buggy style, and dudes <laughs> will just go around and masturbate to it, dude. I'm telling you, it's about to blow up. Uh, Francis founded Mantra Entertainment, which produces the lucrative Girls Gone Wild DVD series in 1997, and the business has grown into a $100 million plus business. It's uh, called Mantra Entertainment? Like yeah. mantra? Like yeah. Om? Yeah. So yeah, he but was just man. sitting there, boobs, boobs, <laughs> yeah. boobs. I mean, just like men walk around going boobs, 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 yeah, boobs. Yeah, That's boobs, what keeps boobs, him going. Boobs, boobs, Titties and boobs. Boobs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are you guys curious what Joe Francis is up to today? He's in jail. Oh, no, I got it. actually. I mean, he did do a couple brief stints uh, in jail and prison, um, but he actually he actually uh, had a gambling debt that he'd run up to Steve Wynn uh, <laughs> and like a court ordered him to pay off his gambling debts. And instead wow. he split to Mexico where he still lives today with uh, his wife, who was like the winner of the Girls Gone Wild Search for the Hottest Girl in America contest in like 2010 or something like that. Dude, oh. that's a that's a meat cute right there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, right on the RV. It's, mm-hmm. a, beat, it's a beat your meat cute. Um, <laughs> there, the 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 Steve Wynn who in Vegas was like well known for abusing. Mm-hmm. low level employee this is such a team nobody story oh yeah, like, yeah. i don't Absolutely. want steve Wynn to get that money but yeah. i also don't want francis to be okay with, like i don't want it to be wiped from his slate and i don't want him to be married to like a former, anyone yeah well do you no, remember that uh, there was i don't know if you remember this story but also in 2004 there was a guy that broke into joe francis's house uh, and filmed a quote humiliating blackmail video and uh, made him pay him off to keep from releasing the video. Do we know what's in the video? Uh, it says okay. I can I got the story on that one. Um, uh, I was asked to rough him up. Riley told me I worked with guys. If they told you to do something, you don't ask questions. Um, what? Sorry, the uh, mafia. Yeah, this guy's claiming it was like, a, but basically, he like made him get naked, and I don't know, I don't know what other stuff he made him do, but uh, yeah, it kind of sounds crazy. a little like when Christopher and uh, uh, when they stole the, uh, the the gift bag from uh, what's her face? Oh, from Lauren Bacall. Lauren Bacall. Uh, it's kind of like that, but with uh, Joe Francis. But then they they decided to do a Girls Gone Wild against him. Oh, they think girls gone wild at him. Yeah. I kind of yeah. like that narratively. I like that. Yeah. I, I know. That's exactly what I thought. I remember when I heard that at the time, I was like, that is such a, like, narratively, that is, is such a nice, it's too perfect of a bow. Yeah. You could to wrap up on this fiction. revenge story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and to the point where I was like, did I just make that up in my head for years? I was like, is that a real thing that happened? Or was that like a revenge fantasy I had? But I guess that was real. Yeah. Hmm. Well, yeah. good for him. He was yeah. briefly in jail for tax evasion, and I think he still owes uh, both debts to Steve Wynn and and the IRS. Uh, and uh, he split to Mexico, which apparently worked out for him. So I can't there believe you go. they don't have an extra- extradition treaty with us in Mexico. That yeah. seems like if, if we're talking war on drugs, that seems like it would have been a useful... Yeah, like- Right. It seems like that would be like, I don't know, line item number one in NAFTA. Exactly. <laughs> like, let's have an extradition order where like if that's why I think that we don't really care about 
ending drug use. Right. We just care about like profiting from it secretly mm-hmm. or policing it in a way that like harms poor people and benefits super right. rich people. I mean, Ex- like, yeah, it's a, it gives us a nice excuse to arrest poor people for for you know right. nothing for a right. victimless crime. If we really and- wanted to stop drug like the drug trafficking like that's happening through this country, we would work with Mexico to mm-hmm. stop it. And we could probably, but we yeah. don't want to. We don't want to. Yeah, it's not profitable enough to stop doing. But, uh, you know, I'm sure that we're close to the end of the war on drugs in the same way everyone at this time was sure that they were close to the end of the war on terror. And um, I'm and sure both of these In the midst wars... of the rise of the lad mag. That's a, th- those are things we're all going <laughs> to... All, yeah, all things that are, uh, you know, fucking beautiful, beautiful moments in American history. That was such a tacky time. That oh, the, God. The, the, the tackiest. Most, yeah. Unbelievably. Like, there's so much Y2K nostalgia happening right now among, like, Gen Z people. And it's like, I don't... I want to, to sit them down and be like, look, I don't want to sound like an old lady, but, like stop like yeah. it, it only gets darker from here like cut off waistbands with visible thongs mm-hmm. chunky blonde highlights carmela soprano early season hair like yes. that's y2k fashion yeah. you don't want to fuck with y2k fashion no yeah we know where yeah. it leads uh mm-hmm. and it le- i mean idiocracy basically was uh, a satire of the aughts because it was like that was that was mm-hmm. just extrapolating from what was happening in like 2003 or four right yeah yeah, you know, if you don't learn from history, you are doomed to repeat it, uh-huh. especially the fashion choices. Uh, movies, top movies in the country at this point are Mission Impossible 3, Poseidon, RV, Just My Luck, and An American Haunting. Mm. The, uh, top- I haven't seen any of those movies. Yeah, yep. I think I. I mean, I think I saw, I saw third, Mission Impossible three. I saw Mission Impossible three. Yeah, it was, I brought my stuff magazine to it so I could do two <laughs> male things at the same time in the theater. Yeah, it's like the not the not gay line of theaters where all the straight guys go to hang out with only other men and watch dude stuff. Yeah, yeah finally we like, can do stuff without chicks here. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, we're not gay. We hate yeah. chicks, but we're super straight. If chicks, um, as soon as chicks get in here, everybody starts turning all gay. Yeah, <laughs> um, I think in 2006, I think May 2006, this is when, mm-hmm, when this aired, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I was working as an AmeriCorps volunteer on the south side of Chicago. So I wasn't like doing anything for leisure. I was like <laughs> eating ramen noodles and like yeah. taking public transportation. That's that's all I was doing. It's good times. You know, those were those were the, the greatest years of our lives. I was probably trying to get hired at Stuff Magazine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> The top rock song in the country was, uh, of course, Danny California by uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. Um, mm-hmm. Classic, Love it. classic tune. Um, and that, uh, that, that about does it for the Remember When machine. All right. So that's what was going on at the time that the episode came out. And, uh, you know, now we're going to talk about the episode. Um, in terms of the Bada B stories uh, this week, um, my Bada B story is uh, based on Vito's story, um, and in place of uh, it's it's goodbye Yellow Brick Road, but it's uh, goodbye Mellow Dartford. Okay, so Dartford is the name of the town in mm. <laughs> in New Hampshire that he leaves, and it's a mellow town. So that's I'm just going to play a clip. All right. And then, uh, you know, at the end, you just you just listen. Go to the end for the whole song. So goodbye, fellow dark four, where the fire department is gay. Go, sure. sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> do be, you guys, do people know that song? I can never tell. Yeah. It's it's Elton yeah. John. Oh, yeah. I know that one. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, that took a lot of time to make. So, 
Let's talk about this episode. Um, first, let's just get some uh, general thoughts about Mo and Joe. Vince, what'd you th- what'd you think about this episode? Uh, I mean, it's a good episode. Slightly scattered. I mean, we all know we all knew that uh, Vito's last weekend in New Hampshire uh, was going to come to an end at some point. And I don't know. I kind of wish that they would have prioritize that storyline above the uh, Johnny Sack storyline, which I find myself mm. not caring about as much. Um, but, uh, you know, it was still a good, solid Sopranos episode all in all. Okay. I did like well, I, the I, angle of the the gardener. It's, it's sort of about, like, the average person getting screwed over by uh, the mafia and sort of just taking people along in their wake, which, you know, was strong, but... Uh, I, I thought it did. I thought it felt more scattered than a, a, other episodes this season. Fair enough, uh, Aaron. Uh, d- do you have any like general thoughts about this episode? Things you liked? Um, yeah, you know, one thing I've noticed about the Sopranos overall, but especially in this episode, is that a lot of the Sopranos is about how much writing sucks, how much it fucking <laughs> sucks to be a writer. Yeah, like Christopher trying to be a screenwriter, like him just going like spiraling as he's trying to write his first screenplay back in like season one or two. Yeah. Um, and in this episode, we have Vito like being a fake sports writer. Like, yeah. I love that like Jim discovers him just doodling and like... <laughs> He's like, like, you're not really a writer. And I'm like, that's exactly what writers do. Yeah. Like, you sit there for hours being like, fuck, I can't fucking do this. And you, you're drawing like stars and that little never ending S chain thing that you learned how to draw in middle school. That's what writing is. It's like eight hours of that. And then you have half an hour where you're like, oh, I got it. I got it. And you write something, maybe 500 words. Mm-hmm. And then the next day you read it and you're like, this fucking sucks. And you start doodling again. So yeah. that that's like literally like the show's writers love to write about hating to write yeah yeah and then there's also this the the um gardener who is like how long do i have to keep doing this and that line (laughs) seemed like it was written by a writer who was like i'm fucking tired of this (laughs) um yeah sorry i interrupted you no i i i do love the idea that like jim walking in and seeing Vito writing uh like just doodling is totally not proof that he's not a writer. No. That doesn't. That right. proves nothing. That's that's just uh, and like the fact that he's like uh, gambling, even more so, is like not proof that he's not a writer. These are right. all. Yet things. he's also drunk by eleven a.m. Yet more uh, yeah. evidence that he is in fact a writer. He's yeah. writing. He's working on a book. It's been a long time since he's gotten any feedback. He has. Yeah. He is. He is drowning in his own brain. Like that's what it feels like, yeah. Jim. I don't, you know, no offense to Jim, but I don't think he's met very many writers. I don't think so either. I mean, I I feel like it's it's clear to me that like the he's fact too, that he's, he's too not sensual writing for writing, like Jim Jim doesn't understand it. He only understands like cooking, uh, yeah, you know, sizzling batter on a hot grill or like yeah. the feel of a hose uh, mm-hmm. being filled with water and sprayed on a fire. Like he only understands like the things that you can yeah, put taste, out fires. And, taste and touch. And, <laughs> and so yeah. writing for him is very I'm just here concept. to make Johnny cakes and put out fires with my hose. All right. <laughs> I don't know what what about writing this or that words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's just like so... I mean, I get that they had to make that that scene like a moment of him discovering not being a writer, but like it would be as though Vito came home and like the house wasn't on fire, and he was like, "Jim, you're not a real firefighter." <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, also, where did where did Vito say that he was? From? Oh, he said he's from Arizona, and he's like, "I'm not actually from Arizona." It's like, yeah, no shit. Have we? Yeah, that was my favorite moment when he goes, <laughs> "I knew it." It's like classic yeah. Arizona accent. Yeah, I'm from Arizona. <laughs> You know, yeah. Arizona. I'm from fucking Scottsdale. Oh, <laughs> Flagstaff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I grew I up over near the Chipotle. Me and my mother, <laughs> we used to go to, what's the other fucking uh, one with the soup? Uh, God damn it. I, I don't know. Arizona iced tea. Oh, I don't know. Is that from Arizona? Um, yeah. I was just thinking it, of strip mall stuff. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I I definitely I, I I love both of those takes. My my take on this episode was that um, this seems to be or at least a theme is uh, is that people in the mafia and around the mafia uh, cannot do honest work. Um, like you've got uh, 
um, different times where that's mentioned, uh, like the idea that like um, Jeannie Sack at, at one point, Johnny Sack is like having to like give up most of his money. But the one thing they're letting him keep is Jeannie's IRA. Um, which is a retirement account she got doing honest work at the at the tie counter uh, at uh, some, you know, uh, department store. And yeah, like, I mean, that's if we take Johnny Sack at his word in that scene, I mean, which is a little bit that's, a little bit up in the air. I thought. I think that's real. Uh, just based on his reaction to it, is just kind of like this idea of like you know the the one thing that's going to be safe is going to be this like honest work thing, and 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 kind of like the mafia's longing to have legitimate income or people in the mafia longing to be able to be people who just earn honest incomes, but not being able to do it. Vito not being able to do, um, you know, construction. <laughs> like, you can't even hold a hammer. Like the scene where he's like hammering and he's like, how do I do that? It's like, if you can fire a gun, you can wield a hammer to pound in a single nail. Like, yeah, he's, well, he's like, like, like he mentioned that he worked in construction, but by that he meant that he took a lawn chair out to a construction <laughs> site and had to sit there uh, while he got paid on his no show job. Right, exactly. Um, yeah, I mean, and Janice also wanting like uh, wanting the free meat uh, <laughs> and and, you know, wanting Bobby to like rise up in the ranks, all kind of just like just people wanting their ill-gotten gains not being able to do anything honestly in fact the only honest job that you see being done uh is by the uh is is bobby's uh trains uh <laughs> watching the mo and joe remove the lumber yeah. was the only honest piece of work you actually saw getting done well, in the episode i like that because like the idea of bobby being into toy trains like they've introduced that before and before it was kind of just like oh that's cute he's got a little hobby and then when you actually see what that hobby looks like and him like doing it I, like my reaction was kind of like well i now i, I have lost respect for him like actually yeah. seeing <laughs> what being into toy trains looks like where you're like oh look at the guy is loading the fake wood like really I that's love, what they do <laughs> i love that he wears the hat yeah. that's the best part of it he's <laughs> he's into it he's like i i love that he's a, a little train nerd it's very cute like there's moments of sincerity between like on all of these bad guy characters, you know, members of the the mob that are like kind of sweet. Mm -hmm. You know, it starts with Tony with the ducks and then, you know, but every see, you know, there's moments where there's like something boyish about them and you're like, oh, man, yeah. these people like have something like nice about them that is now like covered up with these layer upon layers of like masculine Posture bullshit and garbage. yes yeah but yeah. there's something sweet at the root of every single one of them and it just makes you kind of like slightly root for them even though you realize that they're bad guys right because you you like to you like to know that like behind some of these people are normal human things that are not necessarily they're not tied into their masculinity there's something mm -hmm. that there's just something that they enjoy doing that isn't it's fucking trains it's not something you're going to do publicly because you right. have to you always have to hide uh anything that would be not considered masculine right uh, it's like anytime they're doing something that isn't going to make them money or get them laid it's mm -hmm. kind of like oh that's nice oh. <laughs> yeah <laughs> It's very cute. But uh, yeah, so um, you guys both mentioned Sal. Um, we do start uh, the opening scene is Sal the gardener uh, asking Tony how long he has to keep doing this. <laughs> and um, I, I love that like Tony is he just immediately calls him a selfish prick for complaining <laughs> about having to like work this fucking giant uh, property for free. But you're a selfish prick, Sal. You know that? Her husband's in jail. Don't you think this is the time when Mrs. Sacramone needs you the most? And he is forever on the hook. I mean, that's sort house. of a sub theme in this in this episode specifically is that you can mm -hmm. never let the mafia do you do you even a small favor because uh, it won't be worth it. You know, you'll yeah, have they, to, you have to keep taking uh, these two giant houses on the arm. You're going to have mm -hmm. to give up a big part of your uh, construction business in New Orleans. The funny thing about the New Orleans scene, this was kind of a, a, a sidebar a little bit. So Johnny Sack is in prison, right? And he's doing all of his business through uh, his brother, Anthony. And one of the... Yeah, one he's, of the or he's a sinking ship and the rats are in the process of fleeing him. 
Yes, all the rats are in the process of fleeing. Uh, his brother-in-law is is sticking around because he's not connected, and he's trying to help out uh, Johnny Sack um, by making some sort of deal for some New Orleans like. I don't know some business that Johnny Sack has been like uh, yeah. has busted out, and now he wants them to sell. I so wish he can make money. that they had been a little more uh, specific about this. So, I mean, I what I took from it was that uh, Johnny Sack gave this guy a loan in exchange for a piece of this business. So, like, he gave him, you know, did like a classic loan shark thing. So now he has a percentage of this construction business that has since gone on to be worth a ton more, and he's trying to cash out, but. The other guy doesn't want to cash out because he knows that this business is only gonna only gonna increase in value thanks to all the construction contracts after Hurricane after Katrina. Katrina. So that was what I took from that, and that's yeah. So the way that the way that ends up playing out, where Tony goes to dinner with these guys, and the one guy <laughs> one guy wants to sell, and the other guy's mad about selling. Yeah, which they're, is, they're they're brother in laws. Yeah, and. What I enjoyed about this scene, um, or what interested me about it, was one of them uh, had like a really over the top, like <laughs> New Orleans crawl dad accent. Uh, <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Uh, it was, I, I actually have a clip of it. No, you two don't seem like brothers. In laws. He married my little sis. 15 years of womanly company, but I had to come all the way to New Jersey to get truly fucked. You know, I'm doing this as a favor to John. So do we got a problem here? No, sir. I'm buying a boat. Now, you fancy yourself a businessman. Would you sell now with all that money pouring into New Orleans? No, you do, man. You a business man down here, Nolan. Let's, well, let's, let's just say eat. I got a big old plate of etouffee now, and you come <laughs> in here asking me for six folk fools. I don't know about that at all, so no siree. You know, I've seen the scene, obviously, but hearing the sound, I am picturing them both big, like, porcine men rocking, yeah. rocking chairs, wiping, like, dabbing their foreheads with handkerchiefs, like, going, my, my, my. like, they're, they're, just there's an, condensation on their bodies because it's hot. Just an <laughs> alligator with, like, a straw hat that's sort of fraying around the, the brim, and he's got, like, a, he's got, like, a stick to push his boat along. Yeah, the, yeah. I yeah. love the, <laughs> like, a, a crawfish on a fan boat through a swamp, just like, well, I fancy myself a business, man. <laughs> It's just like, I mean, listen, I don't know enough about the New Orleans I'm just accent. a simple country plate of gumbo. I don't know too much about this business, though. But one thing I do know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It is, um, it's just this weird kind of like, I don't know. It's a it's a digression from another digression. Right. I mean, so like, I, the, like the accents don't bother me, but the, the idea that these two brothers are... Uh, like at odds about one wants to sell the other one doesn't want to sell the one who doesn't want to sell like the idea is that he thinks the business is going to continue to be worth more so he doesn't want to right. sell right now like that part i i got but then they added unnecessarily unnecessary complications to it and then later um i assumed the reason tony didn't like beat that guy up was because he sort of saw the logic of his argument and the wheel started turning like yeah maybe i could keep a piece of this for myself. Um, but then he yeah. like turned it into a thing where he uh, used it to leverage so, John's house, which I, he lowered his finding fee, but he, uh, it was a somehow compli- took that. It was too complicated. And it was, yeah. yeah. I mean, this, this episode featured a lot of like Tony being a dick, mm-hmm. like everything, he, like, you know, every episode he's either kind of on the, uh, oh, is he going to do something redemptive? Oh, no, no. And then the next, nope, he's going, he's spiraling down. Uh, like, yeah. it's just sort of this, like, you know, bad chart, like a bad <laughs> medical chart, you know, going down yeah. and down and down. Yeah. And, like, in this episode, he's definitely, like, on a downswing. You know, he's mm-hmm. just being a petty fuck. And uh-huh. I kind of, like, I kind of like that. I mean, it's Tony at some of his most entertaining because it's, like, he's yes. just so cruel. Yeah. Like, he actually a- shows genuine introspection in this episode in that he actually does try to ask himself why he's such a dick to Bobby for for no real reason, even though he continues doing it. But at least he like interrogates the, the feeling a little bit. Mm-hmm. Right. I mean, in general, like they, they sort of turned that storyline 
uh, into part of the Janice storyline, which I thought was like a really strong story because, you know, like Janice is this uh, manipulative, perfect kind of obnoxious villain uh, character. But Mm -hmm. that type of person only stays in their life because they they do manage to guilt you uh, from time to time. And I felt like this this episode was her uh, performing that like guilt and manipulation on Tony really well. Well, I think it was not just about like Tony's plan was bigger than her plan. Like she's Mm -hmm. um, she's been like stunted by, I think, gender roles. She never was looked to as somebody who could possibly like, you know, work for the family or whatever. But she has this sort of like gangster mindset about her own needs. Like when she comes Mm -hmm. into his office, she like barges in and she's like, where's my stuffed pork loin like which is if you isolate it if you just look at a screen with the words on it it's one of the fun it's just so fucking funny janice is so like up her own ass and so into her bullshit that it's like hilarious and when she's in um the sacrimony's house and she's like this just looks like just like the houses i see in italy it's like bitch you're in a mcmansion it doesn't look like the places in italy like (laughs) what are you talking about she's also eyeing it she never says to tony i want this house you know but you know just her it was it was the covetous nature of her walking around the house and just being like i love this house you could see like (laughs) the daggers in her eyes it's like i'm gonna find a fucking way to get this house but the thing is it was like at the end of the episode she thinks that she scammed her way into the house but the only reason she got it is because it was part of a bigger scam that tony was running where he was just trying to punish everyone he was mad at like he was trying to punish johnny sack by getting him to take the house away and give it to his his sister who wanted Mm -hmm. it who thinks that that's the only thing that was going on and like i was also thinking about kind of the gender of it all because this show is a lot about like a Uh, like fading out of a specific type of masculinity. Yeah. Mm. Part of Tony's masculinity is like this rigid enforcement of roles for men and for women. Like Mm. he can't, like he needs everybody to fit neatly into a box. And in this episode, Carmela, you know, he punishes Carmela for not fitting into a box, which is an always available caretaker there to manage the emotions of every member of the family. So yes. he punishes her, and then he rewards his sister for being obsessed with, like, getting this house and, like, performing femininity obnoxiously, but the way that he believes it's supposed to be performed. Yeah. And, like, it, and I feel like that it, it's bigger than just him being a dick to Johnny Sack. It's more mm-hmm. like him kind of trying to keep enforcing like his view of the world. Yeah. You know, you talked about the graph uh, earlier about when he's on a downslope of like, you know, just doing a bunch of bad shit or when he's on an upslope of doing something redemptive. This one, th- there's there's a little tale at the end where you think like, oh, this is a good deed that he's done. You know, he did all this so he could get this house um for for his sister and bobby but realizing at the end that when she finds out about it she's possibly more miserable than she was before she had the house because instead of celebrating this nice thing uh it destroys janice janice is is just crying uncontrollably and to me it's one of the funniest endings of a Sopranos episode and I I have a clip of it I just wanted to say thank you you're welcome no one's ever done something so so okay Janice really (laughs) you got the wine we're almost ready (laughs) what happened no one knows what goes on in my head? <laughs> What's the matter? <laughs> what happened? She's happy. <laughs> <laughs> See, yeah, like I didn't read that as her being destroyed. I just read that as her being so like just generally extra and obnoxious that you can't really even get away with doing her a favor without it uh, being annoying. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Possibly. I mean, I I, I don't know. I, I, she is both a gaslighter and someone who is constantly being gaslit uh, by Tony. Like, Tony does nothing but show disrespect for, for her um, and then sprinkles it with, like, these random acts of, like, doing her favors. Beating up that, that Russian who punched her one time when she, you know, stole Svetlana's leg. Like, he, he does defend his sister. 
um, occasionally like does these nice things for her, but then just always, um, you know, as he puts it, takes a shit on her. Uh, and uh, I feel like giving her this house, doing this really nice thing for her is just m- part of this continued cycle of abuse. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right, right. It's not really a nice thing he's doing for her. It's a mean thing he's doing to somebody else. Yeah. Yes. She was a convenient recipient of this extremely cruel act. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's, yeah. he's killing two birds with one stone. Like he's, he's screwing over Johnny sack while also has having a means of uh, also gaining leverage over Jan- uh, Janice. Like he's, yeah. he's, yeah, he's getting both. Did you know that yearly Medicaid renewals will start again soon? This means millions of people who were enrolled in Medicaid during the pandemic may no longer be eligible for coverage. If this may impact you, the good news is you have options. Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield can help answer your questions so you can find an affordable health plan for you and your family. We want you to feel confident you're covered. Click to learn more. Policy exclusions and limitations apply. Anthem Blue Cross and Blue Shield is the trade name of Community Insurance Company. At Kroger, we want our fresh produce to meet your expectations, which is why we're dedicated to doing up to a 27-point inspection on our fruits and veggies, checking for things like scarring. In fact, only the best produce, like zesty oranges and crisp carrots, reach our shelves. Because when it comes to fresh, our higher standards mean fresher produce. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Valentine's Day is almost here, and we can help with everything from a romantic dinner to floral bouquets, chocolate-dipped strawberries, and so much more. Happy Valentine's Day. Um, further in the in the uh, Janice and Bobby storyline, um, you know, meanwhile, Bobby is, uh, you know, he's playing with his model train sets and, uh, you know, he wants to he wants to do the Polar Express race with his his son, Bobby Jr., who's just just not having it this episode. Yeah, you know, he just um, wants to see a music video because they got some dry ice over there. And that sounds way more badass than uh, <laughs> playing Mo and Joe on the train set than playing on with the choo choo trains. Um <laughs> And uh, this is also the episode where where Bobby uh, does a pickup from a bookies and gets robbed by some uh, some black youths, which is, um, you know, uh, the Sopranos is uh, famously, as discussed on this podcast, <laughs> um, does a pretty poor job of <laughs> of uh, having black characters in general. Um, and uh, this is I, I don't know if this is too much of an exception, but I, I thought at oh. the very least they they didn't um this was a, a, a i don't know <laughs> this feels like it sprang directly from the id of someone worried about super predators like in the late yes. 90s or early odds like odds like this was very much like oh these kids are like super predators they're gonna go rob this guy and uh hold their gun sideways and just murder him without a second thought because that's what they do yeah yeah and it's just like it's this uh yeah it's I I did feel like the the one thing that they did better with this was um they they didn't try to overwrite this the scene or experience that Bobby had um because usually like <laughs> I don't know <laughs> get his joint man I don't know dude like they, they they did some they did some writing on this scene they did they, they did by the way Matthew Weiner wrote this episode of yeah Mad Men fame mm-hmm. so yeah you yeah. know. Matthew Weiner um, is uh, is a g- really good writer, and I love I love Mad Men. Um, but I think that, like in general, it is just hard for the Sopranos uh, in general to escape this like all white <laughs> writers' room. And uh, <laughs> so, yeah, you have this like kind of strange scene that only seems to serve as a reason for Tony to like double down on his cruelness, um, where uh, you've got like. Tony, rather than being sympathetic to the fact that, you know, Bobby is was scared for his life, he got mugged and he's like, you know, he got some concrete in his eye because uh, they shot at the ground, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, everyone else seems to be like, well, pretty they sympathetic. shot at his head, but it, because he was like not really no. paying that close attention, he missed. Yeah. They, yeah. They missed. Um uh, but it's just like the purpose of it seemed to be to show everyone around Tony being like, oh, man, that's too bad for Bobby. And Tony being like, it's his own fucking fault. <laughs> yeah. How was well, that? Like, yeah, just him turning that into Bobby's fault was a uh, impressive feat. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that this season has a lot of like 
the new is bleeding through this imp- like seemingly impermeable like layer of bullshit these mafia people have built around themselves like the old ways are disintegrating before our eyes and the show has like these little pops of like this is actually what's going on literally everywhere else and i think that like not that it's <laughs> i'm not saying that like black teenagers are like assaulting people everywhere but young mm-hmm. people are the ones doing crimes it's not old guys anymore you know right it's like, yeah it's not like you know this big like tubby you know middle-aged <laughs> italian guy picking up money like there's a different type of crime that's happening and that's like a different type of criminal which yeah. is like a younger criminal no i think yeah i 100 percent agree with that i mean like the premise of the the godfather was that these sort of immigrants were coming over here and like mimicking uh mimicking the sort of american uh industrial capitalism and this is sort of the mafia is still uh imitating that is still sort of like that in the microcosm but only now like the mafia is this sort of crumbling empire it's sort of mm. uh like they're trying to live in this bubble uh that mm. pretends it's still the heyday of the mafia but all the time you know the the modern era is going on around them and they right. it, it constantly is constantly interrupting all the shit they're trying to do right. it's like m night Shyamalan's the village like yeah. they're all kind of <laughs> like it's the sec- it's the 60s or whatever you know? right <laughs> But it's totally not. Yeah, as soon as they fucking like enter a neighborhood they're unfamiliar with that doesn't have like a uh, a pork store, all yeah. the, they're they're just like, "What year is it?" You know, they <laughs> yeah. come on, man! I burned the saint. I held the the <laughs> picture of the saint in the, my hand while it burned. That keeps yeah. me. That makes me impervious. I to cut bullets, my hand right? with a knife. <laughs> yeah, and everybody else is like, "What the fuck are you talking what, about? Why'd you do that?" And he's like, "Cause uh, now I'm in a club." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's uh, it is yeah. That, I I do think that that is something that you do see a lot is them being kind of like burst out of this like 1960s bubble of them thinking they're kind of untouchable and and whatnot. Um, but just as it serves Tony's, um. I don't know. It, it, Tony's therapy scenes. I thought it was like a really nice touch because in general, in this episode, we have two Melfi and Tony therapy scenes that I actually really, really enjoyed because you get into kind of the depths of why Janice is annoying and not, not just to Tony, but to the viewer. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and I, I think he explains it really well for maybe the first time on the show, um, uh, in the second scene with Melfi and I, I have a clip, but beyond that, what else did you inherit? I'll tell you what I inherited my mother. Janice got laid. She took off. She laughed at all this shit. Then the trip's over and she's back and she's one of us and she wants her peace. Well, let me tell you, she gets nothing because I got the scars. So it's mine. Like just the idea of Janice does show up second season named Pravati. She come <laughs> back from Seattle uh, where she is up until that point, lived this whole hippie life that you don't really know about. And from scene one of seeing Janice, you know, on the Sopranos, she is back to claim her peace. And, uh, and it's, it's, I I guess it's like the first time I think it's been expressed in that way where I'm like, yeah, that is why she's been annoying from the beginning of the show up until now is, is the fact that she shows up and she's just like scam after scam after scam. How am I going to take a, how am I going to skim off of the skim every, every time? And, uh, it is, um, yeah, it's true. I mean, you I'm know? a little bit of a Janice apologist. I think <laughs> she's really, really funny. Like, I don't get annoyed oh, yes. when I see her on screen. I'm like, yes. Here oh, comes Janice. Oh, I love it. I, yeah. Yeah. Janice don't get me wrong. is back on her bullshit. Yes. Like, what <laughs> stupid thing is she going to say? Like, what over-the-top thing is she going to do? Um, I think that one thing that this show or this episode kind of tells us is that Janice is kind of stupid about some things, but she's got an emotional intelligence and perception that is in line with Dr. Melfi's like Mm -hmm. in the first in the scene where she's badgering Tony about the meat and then about what she's really there for which is like you know why are you disrespecting my husband um she says something about how like you resent me you're mad at me you're always trying to humiliate us like she's sees through Tony's bullshit like his gaslighting bullshit she's right 
yeah. then Dr. Melfi gets Tony to admit that that's actually true. You know, even though yeah. he would never tell her that. Which is funny. And like, I like the way that this show does uh, therapy in a broader sense in that, uh, like, I think a shittier show, the therapist would just always be telling Tony things that are true and like accurate, giving like accurate uh uh analysis uh, psychoanalysis and like the sopranos does that a little but it also shows melfi as uh, almost as obnoxious as like janice or tony mm-hmm. and like in this episode it's like oh boy you kind of you, it puts you in tony's shoes because you really are like oh here she goes with her freudian fucking bullshit again <laughs> But she just trolls him sometimes, I think. He's not going to like therapy sessions. He's going to like trolling sessions. And he responds as though he's like his buttons are being pushed and he gets mad or he cries. You do wonder, like, is this helpful, Melfi, every time? Like, the. The idea that you yeah, like would the point that, out to him. <laughs> oh, it's that, because you wanted to fuck her. And it's like, oh, it's how is that? because you wanted to fuck your <laughs> Yeah, how is that helpful in any way? Like, <laughs> and then when, when he's like, it's normal. It's like, you're not going to convince him of that. <laughs> yeah. And it, even if it, it like, is, what is, how does that help in any way? Yeah, like, it, what? what a weird thing to say. Yeah. It's it's just not it's not helpful even even if it is right even if that's like well Freud is correct in that or you know oh she you know she was a stand in for your uh, early sexual desire that doesn't help this is not like in general you are not <laughs> you're not going to get Tony to be like you know Janice I'm sorry about this for years I was sexually frustrated by you uh, on a Freudian level like no this is stop she's just too she's trying to be too smart for mm-hmm. for tony yeah no um, she's she, yeah like half of her analysis is to make herself feel smart and like mm-hmm. the other half is maybe genuinely helpful but uh yeah there's always she's always operating on those two levels and that's i, I appreciate the way they've written her in that way i mean i think it's not just feeling smart it's feeling better than tony yes because like <laughs> yeah. they're both yeah. italian american and like there's these moments of like Tension where they're in the same space. I think in like season one, he sees her at the at Vesuvio's at the restaurant, you know, and yeah. like mm-hmm. there's what's different between the two of them. Like, you know, she I think that him being in the mafia like makes her a little bit like insecure about her like Italian Americanness. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And like, she's her... she's a Janice to some extent. Like right. she left she's, to she try and needs... not be that. Right, but she's like wants to make sure that Tony knows that she's smarter than him and that they're different, even though they're not that different. Yeah, I do love though uh, that Tony. T- Tony says some things about Janice in this episode that I feel like I don't know. That there's, I I relate to in some way in some of my relationships with uh, people I've known in my life where she says um, all of the bad things that happen in Janice's life. Um, rather than looking at them as like, oh, these are unfortunate things, he has a tendency to just blame her as if like she attracts, she, he literally says like she attracts d- drama, she creams over the misery. And uh, while obviously, you know, there were things like Bobby, you know, almost getting killed um, that, the, you know, Janice had nothing to do with that. But I have known people in my life who I'm like, it just seems that one bad thing after another happens around you. 100%. Yeah. And you put yourself in these situations in which the drama is more likely to occur. And I think there's no more frustrating person, especially if it's someone you love. There's no more frustrating person than than that. So where it's like you can't even find yourself feeling empathy for them because you are like of course this is happening to you again right. you know yeah right. it's like the only thing that all of these bad events have in common is you if like right. bad things keep <laughs> yeah. happening to, i mean sometimes they're circumstantial or whatever of course one bad thing sets up another another one but eventually you have to be like what am i doing what am i doing wrong here right like it's maybe not my fault but i'm right. not stopping these things from happening and there are steps i could take i also I mean, think like a, another hallmark of that type of person is like when those bad things happen um they make it as if it's some sort of uh the universe's conspiracy against them whereas yes. like normal people when like shitty things happen you sort of deal with them one at a time and and like don't lump them all into one 
uh, cosmic conspiracy against you. But uh, like the the type of people that attract that kind of drama, I feel like they treat it very much as like, oh, I can't believe the universe is against me once again. Or like, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. I mean, Tony, yeah. Tony and Janice are both stunted because of their mother. They're both mm-hmm. emotionally stunted and they just, their emotional immaturity manifests differently. Like Tony's manifest by like punching things. Uh, and Janice is, is somebody who's like, like she can't separate single events. Like it's a very immature way to see the world. Like things are happening because, you know, or like it's a very immature way to, to see the world like the universe is conspiring against me. Like a lot right. of the people that drama keeps happening to are also sort of people that are like not super emotionally mature. Mm-hmm. Like they can't understand events as they happen. They think that they're all a part of this grand centralizing of them in uh-huh. the world. Some, yeah, it's a story that they're at the center of. Yeah, you know, but I will say there's also I I do fight back against my own tendency to see that in people because sometimes it really feels unfair. Like I know a guy in San Francisco who got his car broken into like 11 times in two years. And by the ninth time, I just started blaming him. (laughs) And I know it's not his fault. Because he would post pictures. He'd go, dude, I literally have nothing in here. And they keep breaking my window. And even at that point, I just was like, nah, you're doing something, dude. I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah. But that's on you. And I know it, it can't possibly be on him. Um, but, you know, I do have a tendency. To, I have to, like, fight that in myself to not be like, well, cause if, oh, look who's got drama again. Well, if you're, like, if you're in a relationship with that person uh, in any way, like, even if the black cloud is uh, no fault of their own, eventually, like, you just get tired of being hit with, like, the drops that reflect off of them where you're like, I'm going to, I feel like I got to stand a little further away to not get uh, hit with all these raindrops <laughs> from the black cloud that's constantly hovering over your head. Yeah, yeah. We all need therapy is the point. Um, <laughs> um, just to, um, we finished up Janice and Bobby's storyline, but just to finish up um, uh, Johnny Sachs, um we we do have some scenes that we missed that I really really loved. One is like getting into Johnny Sack's brother in law, uh, this guy Anthony, who is I think he's an optometrist or he owns like a, a a glasses store or something like that. And he's one of my favorite characters because he is not mafia connected, but he doesn't. But he he knows that he he has like a familial duty to help Johnny sack since everyone else is kind of abandoning him while he's in prison. Um, and so he, he's the one who tries to broker this deal between, um, Tony, Johnny and the, uh, new Orleans crawdad people. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a great scene where he tries to do mafia double speak (laughs) (laughs) with, Johnny Sack and fails miserably at it. It's it's one of my it's like one of those scenes I always remember from the Sopranos. Uh and I have a clip of that. Listen, as far as that thing goes, the coffee with the chicory. <laughs> the fuck is that? No oh, shit. I suck at talking like this, John. I'm sorry. Our friend with the stomach. In town or near home? Your neighbor. A eh? <laughs> Yeah, all right. Just say the thing I asked you to do. Did you pick up the birthday cake for Jin of the marzipan flowers? The stuff behind the pool? No, an actual fucking cake. <laughs> just, I just love it so much. It is. I think it's the first time I've seen the someone outside of the mafia on this show try to do that kind of talking. And uh, I don't know. It's just one. Of, that's probably my favorite. My favorite joke of the episode, personally. Um, but uh, the, you also find out in the Johnny Sack storyline that Johnny Sack has to uh, do this allocution. So he's going to get um, 15 years and they're going to take four point four point one million dollars. And uh, and he has to fucking he has to he, he takes this settlement 
And part of the settlement is that he has to admit that he was in the mafia. Yeah. Essentially. It's also crazy that like part of the criminal justice system is like, oh yeah, we're have to, we have to decide like the dollar amount that you can pay us and that will affect your uh, jail time. <laughs> yeah. That is insane. Yeah. That's completely insane where they're just like, listen, uh, if you have the money, we will give you 15 years for being in the mafia, the head of a family. And it's like, well, he had $4.1 million. Well, we're not going to put him away for life. You know, <laughs> that's, that's ridiculous. But uh, it was funny because y- you watch like throughout this, uh, this particular storyline, Johnny Sack is, um, he's like fervent. He- he's insistent that he does not, ever snitch he's not gonna he's not gonna name names he's not gonna cooperate at all and he he says as much and when he agrees to the settlement there he's not snitching he's doing a thing called an uh an allocution which is Mm -hmm. the saying yes uh i'm guilty and i therefore i i was a part of a criminal conspiracy and that alone everyone abandons abandons him after that and um it's he's crazy. he's making a morally good choice though like mm-hmm. he's choosing to like leave a little something for his family like he's because it was like look they're going to lose everything if you you know and he so he chooses his family over the mafia which right. is like a good he, that's a good decision that's a redemptive decision on his part but like everybody else in that world is so fucked that they're just <laughs> like what a fucking asshole like for not choosing us over his family you know it is it's so funny too because like the amount of anger it almost feels like uh like it's put on a little bit like this is the same thing with when tony like is first explaining to melfi uh his feelings about homosexuality and there's this obvious front where he's like i think it's disgusting men kissing men where you're like i don't know if you actually think that i think you just you you think people expect you to think that right and and it's it, it seemed like the same thing with um with the way everyone turned on Johnny Sack. And I, I have a clip uh, that wraps up Sal's storyline as well. Uh, after finding out that uh, Johnny Sack had flipped. Hope he dies in there. You know how this looks? I wish I was on a courthouse steps to throw acid in his face. I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what would that help? I mean, it's just like one of those, like it seemed like they were both trying to one up each other there about like who hates him the most. And uh, I don't know, man, it just sort of reminded me of like the stunning and brave episode of South Park where everyone is like, we better say this. Like otherwise (laughs) there's going to be a social punishment as a result. Right. Yeah. It just, it it does seem like they, they have to make it absolutely clear that, uh, you know, they hate him more than, you could possibly like everyone has to one up each other on 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 hating uh poor little johnny sack who just didn't want to leave his his wife and kids uh destitute um but then it continues with uh, the sal storyline excuse me tony uh i was just wondering well not that mr sacrimony is guilty do you, you think i can maybe take him off my route what the fuck did you just say sal i don't know the mm-hmm. fucking lawnmower man just said John was guilty, T. He pled guilty, Sal. Okay? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Maybe they uh, stuck tasers on his balls and beat him mercilessly with a rubber hose. You ever think of that? No. But of course it makes sense. <laughs> so about the yard. You believe this fucking guy? You're done with that. Come on. Let's go check out these DVDs. I feel genuinely happy for Sal in that moment. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. But, you know, here's something I missed when I was watching the episode. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, so his sister is about to have Johnny Sack's house. Mm-hmm. And while Ginny was living in the house, Tony was providing gardening services. But now he's sort of, like, taking that away, like, yeah. before his sister gets the house. Oh, yeah. So it, it's like a little, tiny little snipe at, at oh, it's another fuck yeah, you exactly yeah. yeah this episode is about him finding the balance between doing good and doing evil so every good <laughs> act is immediately yeah. counteracted with an evil act <laughs> that is 
That is quite amazing. Yeah, I I don't think I noticed that either. Uh, that is that's the first time. It's also uh, me kind of noticing that like Sal has figured out something. I think kind of um, like a magical way of dealing with the mafia, mm -hmm. which was he let them vent. He let them say all the shit that they needed to say to front. You know, hey, he's not guilty. What if they suck tasers on his balls? How could you say that? You know, f you're a fucking asshole. And then he's like, yeah, but <laughs> but come on. And he was like, all right, yeah, you're done with that. Like, <laughs> That's actually called gray rocking. That's a technique that psychologists will tell people to use if they have like a narcissistic family member or somebody who's like emotionally fucked up. It's really? Like they will do stuff. Like you'll say something, make a simple request and they will go off on a crazy tangent that is like heightens the emotion of the moment. Yeah. And the only way, the way you bring it back down is just repeat your request at a total deadpan way. Mm -hmm. Like I'm going to, I'm going to leave the house. You're going to fucking leave the house. You're going to uh, blah, blah, blah. You always do this to me. Okay. Well, I'm going to leave the house and then you leave. Like, wow. That's, that yeah. he gray rocked. And that wasn't it, like a well-known phrase or technique but very very good job sal yeah i had no I, i'd never even heard of that but that is i'm gonna keep that in the back on my mind because uh i know a lot of narcissists <laughs> I, I i do stand-up comedy so <laughs> um but uh now finally uh we get into the veto and uh johnny cakes storyline um we talked a little bit about him like sitting in the library, drinking vodka, doing sports betting, not writing. Um, and, uh, and Jimbo catches him not writing. And uh, he finally, you know, tells him the truth about who he is. And I, I will say, um, I think for me, this, uh, this episode might be Joe Ganescali, uh finding his rhythm as an actor uh because i was actually like i was r relatively impressed with how how good he was um in in this particular episode he's been you know he's been great but you know he's playing essentially just like a wise guy right mm -hmm. uh it, it, which is for him he was born in brooklyn you know this is not a huge acting stretch or whatnot but the playing a gay character was a bit of you know a stretch for him but now in in this episode specifically i just thought he really acted he acted his little heart out, and uh, I, I'm, and I'm not just saying that because we just interviewed him, and he's probably listening to this episode. <laughs> I'm, say I'm saying that because I, I truly did think he was great, and I just have a, I have a, a clip of Vito telling the truth to Johnny Cakes. I'm not a writer, okay? I'm not from Scottsdale, and the car's not my sister's. I'm actually from New Jersey. I knew it. Some shit went down. I had to leave. My home. My contracting business, my wife, my kids. Are you drunk? It's not even 11 o'clock. You think it's easy? I miss home so bad my heart's a fucking lump. I'm barely holding together. Stuck in the sticks, running out of money. And now this? You think I was looking for you? I, I thought that was a really great scene. I, 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 was, I was impressed with it. Um, and, and mostly because, like, he's playing a specific type of drunk uh a morning emotional drunk mm -hmm. is a very specific type <laughs> of like where you're you're not having you're too tired to have a full emotional breakdown um you're you're still waking up but you're just drunk enough that like you say something like you'd start talking about your wife and kids and then uh, just the way he said you think i was looking for you i just like yeah. oh that's beautiful <laughs> like he he found love um, um, I found yeah. uh, an article about the uh, basis for the character of Vito. If you uh, want to hear a little of that by any chance, because you know he's based I, on a real guy who is yeah. also named Vito. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, the most openly homosexual Gambino family associate has been Vito Arena, and like Sammy Gravano, he became an important government witness. Arena was part of a Brooklyn auto theft ring overseen by Gotti's predecessor, Paul Castellano, and a murderer. In 1982, he and his boyfriend, Joseph Lee, were arrested on weapons charges. Uh, under cross-examination at his trial, Arena was asked about a photo album found by the authorities in his Brooklyn apartment that contained snapshots of him and Joey Lee having sex. Arena, nice. however, was quick to point out in court that there were about 20 ladies in his dirty picture book, too. 
He was convicted and flipped. His testimony helped convict nine Gambinos. As part of his cooperation agreement, he requested that the feds pay for plastic surgery so that this 250-pound thug, who imagined that Tom Selleck would portray him in a movie based on his life, could hide from mob reprisal. Uh, and he requested leniency for Joey Lee and a cell next to his in Otisville, a medium security state prison in upstate New York, both of which the government granted. Huh. So, hey, good for him. Is, I the will... plur- is the plural of Gambino Gambinos or Gambini? <laughs> I mean, depends. <laughs> it depends which side of the, the, the Atlantic you're on, I think. Oh. <laughs> I, I, uh, I do think it's like a particular, like, that's kind of fucked up then, like, uh, you know, he wanted to be played by Tom Selleck, and they're like, no, nah, we're, ge- we're ge- <laughs> going to give you Joe Gennascoli. <laughs> like, that's uh, that's not nice. But, uh, you know, I, I I feel like Joe Gennascoli is probably a better actor than Tom Selleck, if I'm being Wow, really, let, wow. Let's be, let's Someone be hasn't seen Mr. Baseball. I've seen Mr. <laughs> Baseball. Um but uh yeah i mean i i don't know it's uh i it's an interesting uh character for for him to play in general and uh, you know this this entire storyline has trouble and we've talked about this before between weaving between uh doing like a serious um beautiful romantic love story and not being able to stop itself from doing every gay joke yeah. it possibly can <laughs> the, the fucking sawing and the train going through the like, tunnel maybe one of the funniest scene transitions uh, unnecessary scene transitions i've ever seen was in this episode they're kissing johnny cakes and Vito are kissing he turns Vito over and then cut to uh the choo-choo train going th- <laughs> through the tunnel <laughs> And it's just like uh, you they just can't help themselves <laughs> yeah like the, it's it is really um and you know i i have a just a little sound <laughs> Which, it was uh but it is very funny um so uh Vito is um told by johnny cakes hey you know uh if you need money I can get you some construction work and, uh, and Vito, you know, takes him up on it. And, um, and this is the episode where he realizes that he cannot, he cannot do construction work at all. He, uh, he, he does the thing that if you guys have ever had a job, you hated, Uh, yeah, we have all done, um, which is not look at the clock and try to get, put your head down and get to work. And then you look up at the clock and five minutes have passed, which is, uh, is really just, it, it, I don't think I've ever related to a mobster more than that moment, uh, where he looks, <laughs> where he looks at his clock and he just says, fuck me. <laughs> um, and it's funny too, because, uh, it's also the moment where he immediately right after this happens, uh, he takes off. He, he you, the, you, they don't even show him packing. He, uh, the next scene is Johnny Cakes wakes up and uh, thinks that Vito is in the bathroom, and then yells after him, and he's he doesn't hear anything, and then he checks all of the drawers and sees that Vito has moved out completely, um, which is, uh, I don't know, it's um, it's like a. Similar to the smash cut to funeral, you know what I mean? Yeah. It's 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 the smash cut to uh, I'm getting the fuck out of Dodge, and uh, I I thought that was um, pretty great. I mean, the relationship was it escalated quickly. It sort of moved mm-hmm. at the it moved at the speed of lesbian. I was like, they went on a date, <laughs> yeah. and then they moved in together. Mm-hmm. It really did, yeah. It it really like it blossomed very quickly. I mean, it, it it's only. A uh, three episode arc in which he's actually in um, New Hampshire and he quickly goes from like guy who's sort of creeping on the hot fireman uh, at his day job flipping Johnny cakes to uh, having, you know, living together with a hot fireman who he is making dinner for, you know, and uh, 
Yeah, that that train goes through the tunnel really, really yeah. very quickly. I mean, I and, liked uh, uh, Leah's idea that maybe it was uh, a, a fantasy, like a fantasy of his, because it lives on that line between like fantasy and and maybe that could have happened. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We we don't know whether or not. I mean, that could have been a dream sequence. Who knows? Because that is literally the man of his dreams. Um, and so uh, Vito is driving drunk and crying and listening to Frank Sinatra's My Way, um, which is, I don't know, very on brand, I think, for a a mafia man (laughs) just crying and drinking. Um, And he gets into an accident, um, you know, as he's drinking and driving with uh, the most, I don't know, New England guy. Like, (laughs) he crashes into... Uh, a guy who immediately is just like, oh, he was driving like a maniac, yeah? And, uh, his, his station wagon had, like, a sweater tied around its shoulders. Yeah, exactly. Like, it was, yeah, it was just too too New England for, for him not to get murdered, you know? And, uh, and of course, uh, Vito um, does not want to give out his information, you know? He doesn't want to get the police involved. He just wants to give him money. And uh, the I was guy kinda... won't go for that. Yeah. Uh, uh, and so I have, a, I have a clip. What the fuck are you doing parked out here? Excuse me? I'm getting my mail. You're driving like a maniac. My God. How come your airbag didn't go off? Somebody took it out. They sold it. Sold it? Who would do such a thing? <laughs> Look, I'm really sorry. I-, I was in a rush. So you admit it was your fault? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let me get the damages here, and I'll be on my way. Uh, we should file a police report. You got a phone? No, seriously. What do you say, 500 bucks? I don't want an argument here. My place is just up the drive there. We'll call the police. They'll come right out. Let me get my registration. And then... He dies. Uh, this, yeah. this is this is kind of like in like a shark movie. Like you're waiting for the shark to come eat people on the beach, and then one person's being like super annoying, and you're sort of uh, rooting for the shark to eat them. I feel like this guy is sort of the annoying person on the beach in this situation because that whole that whole scene, he's getting more and more annoying to the point where you're finally like, man, I really wish Vito would just uh, shoot this guy, and uh, and he does. Yeah, it was uh, it was nice to see that like he murdered um, a guy that we all wanted him to murder. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only person that died this episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and everyone only was like, death. "Oh yeah, well I agree right. with that." Yeah. Um, and yeah, and then Vito drives by Satriales and um, and is like, "I'm gonna I'm gonna get some sausage of a different kind." Um, <laughs> And then, uh, yeah, and then the episode ends. And, uh, yeah, I mean, do we have a favorite, least favorite or scene uh, we forgot to mention, Vince? Um, I mean, my least favorite is uh, the muggings, really the mugging. Uh, just, you know, felt very super predator to me, as we discussed. Um, and, yeah. uh, and I think we, dis- we we talked about my favorite, which was, you know, just Vito thinking it's it's oh, it's got to be like 11:45 by now and then looking at his watch and it's 10 till 10. And he's like, yeah. God damn it and yeah, we've all been there. It's like a solid scene. Oh, I love it. Uh and uh yeah, Aaron, do you have a scene favorite least favorite or something we forgot to talk about? Yeah, least favorite was the dinner with the brothers from New Orleans. It just I don't I the business stuff kind of bores me. I Same. kind of am more interested in like I don't want to know how they get the money. I just know want to see the desperation in them getting the money, which is whatever. Um yeah. one of the scenes we didn't mention was the scene where Meadow needs consoling by Tony and he just really wants to eat his <laughs> breakfast. Yeah. <laughs> and he's like, why doesn't your mother handle it? You know, he's just like the he's such a prick, but it's such a great Tony Soprano scene. Cause Meadow is like so, you know, she just need she's having problems with her boyfriend and Tony's just like, Oh God, I'm that, hungry. That is that is my f- yeah you're right I, I i knew i was like there's a scene in here that i love that we are missing that is the exact scene it is just <laughs> the idea that like 
Meadow, for the first time ever, tries to talk openly and honestly about a relationship problem that she's having with Finn. <laughs> and, she, and Tony is just like, you know who would be good at talking about this stuff with? Your Aww. mother. <laughs> <laughs> and then as soon as she mentions premarital sex, he's like, well, you're living in sin. You know, I don't know what you expect. <laughs> it's just, it is, oh, it's such a great, great moment. Um, I think... I think that might be the best. You're right. That is that is very good. Um, yeah, and and let's see. If I had to give this episode a letter grade, uh, and I could give it any letter grade, as we know, I think I would give it a B plus. Vince, what would you what would you give this episode? Yeah, yeah, B plus. Hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. uh, Aaron, uh, if you uh, were to give the show uh, this episode a letter grade, what what do you think you'd give it? Mm, I would probably give it a B, solid B. Solid B. Yeah. Okay. So that's uh, two B pluses and a B. I think if you average that out, that's a solid B plus episode of The Sopranos <laughs> and a solid A plus episode of Pod Yourself a Gun. Aaron, Gloria, Ryan, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thanks a lot. This was really fun. Yeah, it was a great time. Where can people find you uh, on the internet? Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Morning Gloria. And uh, you can listen to Hysteria on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. It comes out every Thursday. It's it's a really fun. It's a fun show. I have fun doing it. Hope you have fun listening. It's a great show. Check it out wherever you get your podcasts. Patreon.com slash Frotcast for all of the bonus episodes in which we talk about everything that's not Sopranos as well as Sopranos stuff. $8 gets you a shout out. Vince. We have some new $8 patrons. Are you going to put on your your nickname hat and give them a little shout out? I sure can. Okay. Sorry, I burped. Um, First is Andrew Wright. Oh, we're going to call we're going to call this guy. uh, What's that guy's name? We're going to call this guy uh, Jaeger because, you know, he's got the right stuff. Okay. Fair enough. He's breaking Uh, the sound barrier. Okay, sure. Uh, and next, we've got uh, Nick Guzman. Hey, it's the goose. The goose is loose. The goose is loose. Yeah. <laughs> gobble, gobble. Wait, no, that's a turkey. What gobble, sound did- gobble, goose. Uh, uh, gobble, gobble, Guzman. The- All right, so wh- what do we call him? The goose? Yeah, the goose. Okay. The- God damn. The goose. Uh, next this is, is why I do t- the nicknames. Yeah, I know. I, I got to stop. I forgot to, to shut my mouth. Um, Thomas Finnis. <laughs> Finnis. Uh, yeah, we're going to call this guy. Uh, we're going to call him Detrolio. Finn. Finnis. Oh, right. Finnis Detrolio. All he's right. the boyfriend of Meadow. It's oh, no, I got nickname. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That works. Uh, next is Damian Wayne. Oh, <laughs> we call this guy in living color because he's. <laughs> One of the Wayne brothers. No, I got it. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Next, we have Cam F. Wait, your last name's F? Uh, just F. That's what was listed. Uh, we call this guy the Flunky. Okay. Cam F, the Flunky. Because he, he gets an F. That's he all gets he, an F, yeah. That's all he gets. All right. Yeah, no, you got it. Yeah. Next is Jack. Just Jack. Hmm. Yeah. We call this guy... Uh, we call this guy uh, Jackie Two Shoes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, you, you didn't get have much to work with. He's got two but... shoes that he's always wearing because he's got two feet. Uh, yeah, got it. <laughs> <laughs> I assume. And, I don't know. Maybe he doesn't. Yeah, uh, and f- we have Daniel Marins. Hmm. Hmm. Is that Mark Marins? Uh, <laughs> it's Mark Marins' brother. We call this guy. Who's your guys? Uh, who's your guys is a whole ass nickname i love it um and then um finally because he upped his bid to uh three hundred dollars give another nickname to kenley kenley bidwell yeah i call him uh kenley bidding war because he's starting a bidding war for the title of uh highest donor on patreon yeah yeah, yep. Ken Lee, the bidding war bid well. Mm-hmm. He doesn't just bid well; he bids high. It's not just a clever name; it's also true. That's absolutely right. Those are your eight dollar 
uh, patrons for the week. If you donated eight dollars and you're like, "Hey, I didn't hear my name," that's because we're gonna get you next week. So hey, don't worry. Speaking what? of names, what's up? Uh, while we were recording this episode, I I, I clicked, I looked up Matthew Weiner because you know he wrote this episode. Yeah, uh, and he has a kid, and uh, he named his son, and I feel like he's like trolling for for the like he named his son Martin Holden Weiner. <laughs> God, <laughs> that is. I mean, come on, man. What Holden is he Wiener? doing to him? Martin Holden well... Wiener. That is. Hey, look, there's Martin Holden Wiener. You know, but at least, <laughs> <laughs> at least it was creative. My first thought was he did not name him Richard. Like <laughs> that was what I was afraid of. But he wouldn't be that uncreative. He actually, that's pretty good. Yeah. Maybe he's you know Holden like uh, you know. Like the lead character from The Expanse. Hey, man, you Holden? It, yeah, Holden Wiener. <laughs> James Holden Wiener. That's what they call me. <laughs> Leader of Space. It's a great show and an even greater book series. Read it. Um, Yeah, so uh, also, I just want to say, if you at some point gave $8 and you're like, I've actually never gotten my name read, uh, let me know, uh, because I I try really hard to not miss anybody, but it's possible, so let us know. Broadcast at gmail.com for all of your questions, comments, and concerns. Vince, what is the Google Voice number? 415-275-0030. All right, everyone. Thanks again so much for listening. And until next time, don't stop believing. When are you going to come out? Where are you going to land? You should have stayed with Jimbo. You should have learned to work with your hands. We don't got to stay there forever. You think he was looking for you? He's not a present for some boys to open after he's made them a plate of gold. In my future lies beyond your most fire. What do you think you'll do now as you're speeding down the highway? It'll take you a moment of vodka and crying to get you to murder again. Maybe you'll get some protection. Maybe your crew will accept you. As long as Philly Leotardo doesn't get his hands on you, Bob. Finally decided my future lies 